countries and countries that spend more. So where am I? Where was I? Um, so this is the fundamental. I think this is the fundamental challenge. Um, but when and and you know I was so I was mentioning sort of a, a, when we talk about obesity and we talk about and let's say we talk about the grocery stores. Well, in fact, studies of putting grocery stores in neighborhoods haven't changed diets, right? And the and when we think about that, we've we've thought about it in a very convenient way from a supply. And I'll I'll go on. I can go you know from a supply side, right? That we are going to supply the grocery store. We've assumed that that's the problem because there's no grocery store. Well, if you look at the research, 95, 90, a lo the large number of people will say, yes, I can get the groceries I need. I get a cab, I take a bus, I get a friend's car, and I go to the large big box store because that's the place I want to go. I can get everything in one place. I can shop and get things cheaply, and I can get the things that I can cook in time because I don't have the time to cook a, 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 a home meal. It isn't about, and, and so if we really wanted you know, everyone, more people would love to cook healthy, fresh meals at home if they had the time and money. So it comes back to some really fundamental needs that I think are the barriers to healthy eating and active living. And the, when, I, when I hear about healthy eating and active living and I don't hear people talking about those kind of fundamental needs, it, I, I, I think something's missing. Um, so we know we can do, you know, we know this doesn't have to be the case because countries that spend more on social safety nets and spend less on health care have better health. Have, um, a little bit closer to home, Elizabeth Bradley and Lauren Taylor's book, The um, American Healthcare Paradox. Yes. Um, so they make the, they've looked at the, rel the, spend, the social spend and the health care spend in peer countries. The, when you look at the total spend, the health care and social spend, the U.S. It, the US and, and these other, quote, kind of like liberal European countries are all spending about the same. But the other countries that are do, doing better in health are spending more on the social safety net and less and much, much less on health and the, the sort of the downstream. These countries also have implemented public policies that assure uh, a basic level of shared needs decent wage floors, paid parental leave, universal paid sick days. Um, these are things that, you know, early childhood education, uh, social housing, 20% social housing typically, these are not policies that we, we, that we have in our social contract, as you all know. So as health professionals, we witness this day in, day out, and, but why don't we do anything? As individuals, I mean, we're not trained. We're not trained and in medical school to be to re go and look upstream. More importantly, we're not organized. Right? We're not acting. We have no forum, I think, to act together uh, on uh, the problems uh, uh, caused by poverty. I can tell you, doctors are you know they see this. They're frustrated. They want things done. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson did a study. Eighty-five percent of primary care physicians see social needs as impairing the health of the people they care for. They're care for. They want something to be done. They want the health systems to do something about it. Okay. But there isn't a path. There, right, there right now, there hasn't been kind of a sort of a clear path. Um, we're supposed to be an evidence sort of based sort of uh, profession. And we have tons of health evidence that says, re justifies rethinking our policies. But this isn't the. This isn't typically where we're applying. How we're applying our evidence. We most of the applications of evidence are really kind of on the on the health care policy side. How are we going to? What reimbursement rates are, are, are going to be uh, applied? Well, what if what if we did account for the health impacts of our policy choices? And this was, I think, the very simple idea that sort of I I, I came to um, in working in in San Francisco. I had um, been. Uh, in public health school, and um, I had learned things. I'm, you know, some things I'd say for like effect hyperbole, um, um, uh, but I had learned a, a lot about environmental laws, and I'd learned about this one environmental law called the Environmental 
uh, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. Nas so the National Environmental Policy Act passed in 1973, I think, 71, 71 or 73, um, said that every federal decision that could potentially have an impact on the environment should have an environmental impact assessment that looked at not only environmental impacts, but looked at impacts on, on society, on culture, on health, on everything. And um, this law, we didn't really, hadn't ever been applied by, by health practitioners. You know, here's a tool to get, and these health impact assessments had been being, you know, have been done for 40 years. And there's a clause that say, you know, federal government, thou shall study the health impacts of decisions. And nobody in public health had said, had picken, taken this law and said, we're going to use this law, and we're going to get a health analysis done, right? Social impact assessment had happened. Um, so we said, well, there, there's, there's something there. What, what would happen if we started to take, you know, to bring health analysis Policies, you know, there's pros and cons, there's lots of factors that you have to weigh, but health wasn't being weighed as a factor. So what if we bring, what if we bring health and we, we add it as another weight on that scale? Would we tip the scale? Um, was the, the kind of a, a idea in, in my head. Um, and so in San Francisco in 1999, we began to, to develop and champion the use of this tool called health impact assessment. And the way we did it the first time was a, was a, a you know sort of a bit fun, um, and at the time I didn't even we didn't use the term health impact assessment, uh, which had been being which had been done in Europe and was used as a term in uh, Europe. We just kind of had the had the concept without the name. Um, so I there was San Francisco was uh, considering a living wage ordinance, and. Um, uh, you know, we thought, wow, you know, how much literature is there on income and health? Right? Has anyone tried to bring that literature in and, and do it? You know, there was an economic analysis that said what would happen to unemployment, what would happen to wages, um, but no one had done that kind of health analysis. So we went to the, the uh, Tom Amiano, who was the county supervisor at the time, and said, hey, we can do this analysis. How about you write a letter? to my boss and ask us to do that analysis, okay? And that's how things, that's how things happen, right? So, and uh, he did that and we did this analysis and we quantified the living wages impact on a broad set of health goals from um, longevity to um, um, uh, sick days and, and uh, men, uh, depression uh, scores and childhood, child uh, high school graduation rates, um, and uh, uh, teenage pregnancy, a, a lot of you know, different outcomes. It was, a, it was a literature, and of course, increasing the wage would be good for all of you know, these things. And we brought that analysis before the board, and um, it was used, and, uh, and groups then, you know, repeat, the advocacy groups repeated it. Probably the, wage, the increase of wages in San Francisco would have passed anyway. Um, but others took up that idea and used it in living wage struggles across uh, the country. And this began, uh, you know, sort of a, a new practice for us that we eventually institutionalized in San Francisco government. And we um, use this to use this practice uh, to support. We're not the only actors here or the only interest to support the passage of the first paid sick days law in the country in, in San Francisco uh, to, to champion um, uh, uh, a, a law in California um, that uh, demanded that uh, domestic workers have be allowed the same labor rights that everyone else had, that they were, they were currently kind of uh, excluded for. And more recently, uh, to demonstrate why uh, our, um, um, our, our, our policies of incarceration of low-level offenses are incredibly damaging. Um, all things that where we were able to bring a health argument and contribute to a constituency that helped um, achieve a, a sort of a, a, a progressive win. So health impact assessments, they demonstrated that we could go, you know, 
public health was in a in kind of a silo, operating in its silo, and at the time struggling to figure out how does it the understanding that it's a healthy city we need, but how does it work? What are the tools? I mean, uh, that it can use other than uh, 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 research. The difference between epidemiology and health impact assessment is the sort of prospective and kind of applied and context specific nature uh, of of the of the uh, health impact assessment. Um, we could do this. We could analyze economic policy, and that was new. Um, we could give social justice movements new tools for advocacy, and what this did was develop was develop relationships and trust between a public health agency and and um, social justice actors in the community. And that was really, really, really key because this became a constituency, a political constituency that protected this work that's potentially threatening uh, for, for, for some in the system. It also became a source of people who demanded this work and, 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 and people who could say, here's where we really need some help, right? Um, it helped us. So we can do a health impact assessment on something that people in the community don't care about because we've discovered that there's a relationship to health and we should do it. But if we do a health impact assessment on something people in the community care about and are working on, we have an audience. We, have a, we, have, we, have a, we can magnify that voice much more than we can simply uh, sort of in, in, in being a, an agency. Um, Health impact assessments reframe the value of the policy change. When we did a health impact assessment on paid sick days, nobody was making a health argument for paid sick days. Huh? Really? You know, health, sick days is a right. Sick days will lose, lose jobs. Sick days is a right. Sick days will, you know, lose jobs. You know, what about the health benefits of paid sick days? And when we, we, were, we were asked by the National Partnership of Women and Families to do a health impact assessment on this. We looked at the literature. There was four studies in the published literature in PubMed, one in the economics literature that was decent in, and, a, and a couple of other like really random, small, not so good studies in the public health literature. Nobody in public health, no one in health science had looked at sick days as a risk factor deeply. Um, this, this, you know, by doing the health impact assessment, people started talking, politicians started talking about this law differently. Yeah, you know, if we want sick restaurant workers not to work when they're sick, we need sick days. Right? If when we want influenza, you know, when you're having the SARS, you know, thank God, we did this and SARS happened, right? So it was good for us. I mean, good for our, um, uh, you know, oh, President Obama was saying stay home. It's like, yeah, you need sick days, you know, uh, President Obama, for us to sort of stay home. So it, it reframed the conversation from being kind of business versus labor to business versus labor and health. And, and that was important. Um, we built relationships across institutional silos. Um, when we first did this work, um, it was threatening. Um, and we were, you know, why are you in our business? Said the planning department. Um, we were um, uh, we were, you know, demonst demonstrating why letting a, a project, um, uh, letting a developer bulldoze an apartment uh, building to build condominiums um, uh, that, and would re result in dis dis displacement, why that thousand dollars that that developer was giving the tenants in 1993 just wouldn't cut it, right, in terms of protecting health. You know, why are you in our business? and? to the point where the planners said, you know what, you're making us, you know, the work we're doing is good for health, and that makes us feel good. Um, and so that institutional change happened. It took some, you know, it was, it was rough at, at times, but ultimately agencies embraced and said, no, we're the health champions, right? We're gonna, we want to use these tools. We want to use these health metrics um, uh, in San Francisco, and that's kind of what we, we you know, that was uh, more than we hoped for, and, uh, but definitely the, the right thing. The scope of public health needs actually authorizes public health to intervene in many ways beyond its mandates and boundaries. But 
you know, we were, it's, it's stuck often, like, okay, we're paid to do this, and here's our regs, and we can't, you know, my, I need my boss's permission. Okay, you don't need your boss's permission. I mean, you need your boss's permission if you want to keep your job, right? Right, right. who wants that, right? Right? Um, but, you know, you can, you know, in, in this case, I mean, there's a mission, and there's a constituency sort of demanding this work. The... The, the, the needs of public health authorize, you know, gives you, gives us latitude. And maybe there's something about being um, a physician, you know, trained in the kind of forget the rules, just get, you know, get the job done school uh, of work that also um, comes, uh, comes into it. But, 